Chapter 23, the digestive system. So the main learning objectives, just like any other chapter, is for us to master the anatomy and physiology of that system. So we'll be identifying all the organs that make the digestive system and their main function. We will also study some accessory organs that are required for digestion. We'll study how the function is regulated, the activity is regulated, we'll study that. And we'll see how uh, nutrient absorption and water absorption happens in your intestine. We'll also touch upon the neural control, the hormonal control, and the enteric nervous system uh, of the digestive tract. So this picture in the bottom shows that in order for us to survive, you know, you need the four macromolecules, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, water, vitamins, and minerals, right? They are macronutrients. And then you need certain elements in small quantities. So in order for survival, we need all these nutrients. And the only way we can provide these nutrients to the body is through uh, ingestion or eating the food. So the food that you eat, will be broken down by your body. It's, a, it's called catabolism. And then what your body is going to do is, it's going to take the, the raw materials from the broken down food and it will string together the proteins it requires. So you are providing the building blocks for, for the body to make all the proteins and other chemicals it requires for survival. So the digestive system heavily overlaps with your cardiovascular system, your immune system, uh, your lymphatic system, and many others. So let's see the different parts of the digestive system. So it's only a tube, right? Uh, a gastroenterologist specializes in the digestive system. So the scientific study is called gastroenterology. And um, it's a tube that starts from your lips or in your mouth in the oral cavity. It is called GI tract or gastrointestinal tract, also called alimentary canal. So it's a muscular tube that extends from the oral cavity up to your anus. So as the food travels through this tube, it's going to encounter different organs so that the food is broken down into smaller and smaller elements so that it can be absorbed by the body. And all along the tube, there'll be accessory organs also, which is vital for digestion to happen. So here is the GI tract. It starts from the oral cavity, so we can see the mouth. And then here's the oral cavity. So where we have the, our tongue and all the salivary glands. So we will take in the food and the food is uh, chewed up in your mouth. It is mixed with saliva and a little bit of digestion starts here. Not much absorption. And then you probably know it will travel through the pharynx, which is the back of your throat. And you are, you are very familiar with this long tube called esophagus that will, it's a bridge that will take the food down to your stomach. The stomach will continue digestion by secreting a lot of hormones and enzymes and acids. From the stomach, it enters the small intestine. This is where most of the absorption happen. So there'll be lots of absorption. 90% of the ab nutrient absorption happens in the small intestine. Then it travels to the large intestine it's large, that's why it's called large. It's larger than the small and it frames the small intestine. So uh, when it travels through the large intestine, it will absorb most of the water and all the waste materials that your body does not require will be compacted. And then we would defecate or get rid of the waste through your anus. So this is the GI tract. 
So studded all along the track, there'll be special cells. So here it's mechanical digestion, stomach, chemical digestion and mechanical digestion, liver, uh, pancreas, gallbladder. So all of them will have some special cells to help with digestion and absorption. And all along the tube, there are nerves, you know, so apart from the digestive tract being under the control of the central nervous system, it has its own nervous system. It's called enteric nervous system. You know, that's my gut feeling. So that means it can make its own decisions. Depending on the type of food, the secretion will, uh, will be different. And it is also, remember malt, mucosa associated uh, lymphatic tissue. So it is also a huge uh, defense immune system uh, organ, GI tract. Accessory organs to aid in digestion, we have the tongue, we have teeth in the oral cavity and salivary glands. So all, these are all helpers for digestion. Liver, you probably know, will make bile that will play a huge role in fat digestion. Gallbladder will store and concentrate uh, the bile. Pancreas, it's both an endocrine organ and an exocrine organ. Uh, we studied that uh, when we studied the endocrine system, it can make uh, insulin and glucagon that plays a huge role in uh, homeostasis of blood sugar, but it's also an exocrine gland. So it makes a lot of digestive enzymes. So these are all the accessory organs. So in this uh, lecture, we are going to study each one in more detail. We'll study the anatomy, physiology of each one of them. All right, what is the function, main function of the digestive system? Main function is to break down the food mechanically or chemically. And we have to absorb the food and get rid of the waste. So we can follow a piece of food from your mouth to your anus. So as the food travels through the GI tract, it's going to be changed into smaller and finer forms so that we can absorb the nutrients and get rid of the waste. So the first function or step in the digestive system is called ingestion. Ingestion means just to eat, put food in our mouth and eat it. In the mouth, there is a grinding happening. So that is called mechanical processing and the tongue will push the food to the back of your throat. So it's propulsion of food. A little bit of enzymes are there in your mouth so it will start the chemical uh, digestion process. All along the tract, there are a lot of secretory cells. They will secrete a lot of uh, acids like your stomach is going to secrete a lot of acids and hormones for digestion. And like in the duodenum area here, there's lots of uh, buffer secretions. And in your small intestine, it's all about absorption. 90% of the nutrient absorption happens in the small intestine. Most of the water is absorbed in the large intestine. And then the waste is gotten rid of, is called defecation. So these are the six main steps or functions of the digestive system. So what is the connective tissue that covers and protects all the uh, organs in the abdominal cavity? So when we studied uh, the lungs, we saw pleura, right? Visceral and parietal pleura. And in the heart, we saw the pericardiums. Here in the stomach, it's peritoneum. So all the, the connective tissue, it's a serous in nature. They secrete uh, a transudate for lubrication. So if it, the membrane that is sticking to the intestine or your stomach is called visceral peritoneum. The lining of the abdominal cavity is parietal peritoneum. And the liquid in the peritoneal cavity is the peritoneal fluid that will play a huge role uh, in lubrication because your stomach and your intestines are not static. They are very dynamic. There is peristaltic movements and segmentation that's happening. There's a lot of churning action that's happening here.
So it's very interesting to see that our body can make about seven liters of peritoneal fluid every day. And here you can also see the parietal peritoneum. See, it's very slimy and slippery uh, in order to, because it's serous in nature, the epithelium is serous in nature. So you, we can see the visceral, the parietal and the cavity here. This is to reduce friction. How are the different organs of the uh, digestive system kept in place? How are they suspended in your abdominal pelvic cavity here? They are suspended and they are kept in their place by ligaments. See, for, for example, you can see the liver, the accessory organ is uh, connected to the diaphragm. So they all connected. Uh, so the spleen will be connected to the diaphragm too. So, and it is also connected to the back, the posterior wall of the abdomen. The connective tissue that is anchoring all these organs is called mesenteries. They are attaching all the organs to the abdominal wall. It can also, it is also, see, this is a mesentery. So it's a connective tissue. It is, it has a rich supply of arteries and veins. So this is where the blood supply is. And it is also a reservoir of fat. So they are double sheets of peritoneal membrane that will suspend the digestive tract in the cavity. There are two interesting main uh, parts of the mesentery. One is called greater omentum. See, it looks like an apron in front of your abdomen. So it is protecting the delicate colon and it's a reservoir of energy. You know, like when you gain weight and um, your stomach um, flows over your belt, it's this omentum, greater omentum. The lesser omentum, lesser omentum can be found like a hammock under the stomach. So it keeps the stomach in position. And then all these lines that you're seeing are the mesenteries. So here is the abdominal cavity. You can see the vertebra and then all the abdominal muscles will be here in the anterior part of your abdomen, protecting the abdomen. Right under the muscles, you'll have the greater omentum for per further protection and a reservoir of fat. And then we can see all the mesenteries rich in blood supply and uh, connective tissue. They arise from the abdominal wall and they keep all the colon in place. So in the GI tract, as you go down the GI tract from your oral cavity to the anus, the type of epithelium will vary. For example, in the mouth, we studied in AP1 in chapter four when we studied tissue. If the organ is found closer to the outside of the body, it is usually stratified, right? So we, we can see stratified squamous epithelium in the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and in the stomach, small intestine and large intestine, you can see the, these columnar cells. And among the cells, you can see special uh, secretory cells. They are goblet cells that make a lot of mucus. So you, the whole GI tract is slippery inside so that the food can easily uh, move through the tract. So like we have special cells, like in the stomach, there are special cells that make uh, hydrochloric acid to keep the pH low because food is usually uh, coming in, entering the body with a lot of bacteria in it. You know, so the acid in the stomach will kill all the microbes that you have ingested. And then like intestines, you can see the goblet cells that will make a lot of mucus. So the oral cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus, they have to take a lot of mechanical stress. stress. They are made with uh, stratified squamous epithelium. The function of all the other GI tract organs like the stomach, small intestine and the large intestine. So this is where absorption and secretion has to happen. It is made up of simple columnar epithelium. In the small intestine where absorption happens, it will have a lot of uh, villi and microvilli to increase surface area. And studded all along, you can see the goblet cells that will produce a thick uh, mucus. 
it's a glycoprotein which is protective in nature and then it will help in the movement of food and studded all along the GI tract, we have special cells called enteroendocrine cells. These cells will produce hormones and they will coordinate the activity of digestion. How is the GI tract controlled? So the GI tract is controlled by the central nervous system. It has its own nervous system called enteric nervous system and also hormonal control. So here, this picture explains how this is very complicated. Digestion and control and regulation of digestion is very sophisticated. So as soon as you see food, you know, you just seen some food, somebody eating a burger, you saw it, or you smelled pizza, or maybe you tasted some food, or even the thought of food will prepare your stomach for digestion. So the central nervous system will pick up all these food signals. It will send a message and then it can affect the enteric nervous system. It will also influence the effectors in the wall of the GI tract and ask it to contract so that it can move the food down. And also it can uh, influence all the secretory cells to make mucus and uh, hormones. Studded all along the GI tract, there are chemical receptors that can pick up changes in uh, food is nothing but a chemical, right? Carbohydrate, protein. So these chemoreceptors will pick up those signals. Osmoreceptors will pick up changes in osmolarity. Mechanoreceptors will pick up uh, the stretching of the GI tract when food is found there. So stimulus for action can come from the brain or from the enteric and hormonal system itself. We already studied the, the autonomic nervous system, right? Parasympathetic will stimulate the GI tract. Uh, yes, so when you have a good night's uh, rest, the parasympathetic uh, nervous system will help you have a good digestion when you sleep well. Whereas in your fight or flight response, when your body in sympathetic nervous system mode, it will inhibit digestion. The endoendocrine gland cells that I told you about, they make hormones that will regulate the activities of the GI tract. All along the GI tract, we have the enteric nervous system, which is part of the peripheral nervous system. And it, will, uh, it is, uh, can be uh, modulated by the central nervous system. So let's uh, follow the journey of food from the oral cavity to the anal cavity. So the oral cavity is the mouth. It's also called as the buccal cavity. So when you put food in your mouth, so it will travel through, uh, I mean, your lips is the first encounter, then there's a vestibule, and then you can see the teeth. And you can see the roof of the mouth. So we, we are seeing the maxilla and the mandibular bones here. So we see the hard palate that becomes the soft palate that ends in the uvula. The sides of the oral cavity would be your cheeks and the tongue forms the floor of the oral cavity. In the cross-sectional view, you can see more details, so we see the lips, the vestibule, and you see the tongue, the different type of muscles of the tongue, that's why it's so versatile, the body of the trunk and the root, uh, the root of the tongue. You can see the cheeks that form the sides of the oral cavity. The roof of the oval ca oral cavity is the hard palate that becomes the soft palate and that ends in the uvula. So from the lips to the uvula, it is the oral cavity. A lot of things will happen in the oral cavity. So when you put some food in your mouth, sensory analysis of the food will happen. So the taste receptors in the tongue that we studied uh, is going to taste the food. And only if you decide that the food is good for you, it is not spoiled, then a little bit of decision-making will happen here. 
So you would voluntarily swallow the food only after it passes the sensory analysis test. Let's say you feel a piece of uh, paper or hair in your mouth, you usually spit it out, right? So that is sensory analysis of food. So decision-making happens in the oral cavity. And then what happens is the tongue is so versatile. You know, it's very important for articulation, but it also plays a huge role in sensory perception of food and it will guide the food under the teeth so that the teeth can grind it. So remember, we are breaking down large particles of food into finer particles of food so that it can be worked on by enzymes and later absorbed. So this is called mechanical processing of food by the teeth and the tongue. It will also throw the food up, uh, up against the hard palate. So it throws the food all around the mouth. So you're enjoying the food in your mouth. Uh, you're analyzing the food and grinding the food. And as the food is in your mouth, all the salivary glands will start to secrete saliva, which is rich in water and enzymes also. So we are packaging the food and lubricating the food in the mouth. A little bit of carbohydrate digestion uh, by uh, salivary amylase happens in the mouth. Very, very uh, trace amounts of lipid digestion here. The oral cavity is lined by Carotenized, non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So, here this is a picture of all the salivary glands. We have two parotid salivary glands. This is the parotids right on, uh, under your ears here. Submandibular under the tongue. And then we have sublingual salivary glands. So you'll be surprised as to how much saliva we make in a day. So the tongue plays a huge role in sensory uh, for grinding, uh, helping with grinding of the food. We make about one to 1.5 liters of saliva every day. Most of it is made by the submandibulary uh, salivary gland. So the saliva will moisten the food and then it will help to package the food into a small packet so that you can swallow it, so that it will fit into the esophagus. So saliva, the chemical composition of saliva is mostly water. It does have a little bit of amylase and uh, bicarbonate to neutralize the uh, food so that it's the pH of your mouth is always around seven. So it's neutral. Saliva is neutral. It also has some electrolytes. So now the food that is packaged in your mouth is called bolus. Here's the word, bolus, bolus. So it's partially digested, it is moistened, and then it is taken on like a, a round to oval shape so that it's easy to swallow. Another main thing that's happening in our mouth, our oral cavity is our teeth. So the white part of the teeth, we call it the crown of the teeth. It's above the, the gingiva, which is the gums. So the, the crown. Uh, neck is the point of the teeth where, where it enters the bone. The hole in the bone is called alveolar process. The teeth is anchored in the bone by a periodontal ligament, periodontal membrane or ligament here. And then you can see the different layers of the teeth. Enamel is the hardest part of the teeth followed by dentin. And then it's in the root canal where you see the arteries and veins. It's also called pulp cavity. The gums is the gingiva. So the teeth is kept in place by the gingiva, by the alveolar process, the periodontal uh, ligament, and cementum. cementum. So these are the happenings. So the teeth is very important for grinding your food, for tearing your food for masticating the food. Here, like uh, this is like one side of your uh, mouth. So you can see in the upper and lower jaw, you can see the incisors. So it's like a knife. It is very good for cutting your food, chopping your food. Canines is for tearing. If you want to like, especially eating meat and stuff, you need canines to tear your food. And then molars are all for grinding. So we have the bicuspid premolars and the, uh, the molars. So these are the grinders of your teeth. 
So after the food is packaged into a bolus, it will enter the pharynx, which is the back of your throat here. So we have the nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, right? So here you can see the, here's the palatine uh, arch of, and here's the uvula. So when you swallow the bolus, the first uh, point of entry would be the um, oropharynx here. So oropharynx then will lead into the uh, esophagus. So the pharynx is the common passageway for both foods, liquids, and air. It is made up of stratified squamous epithelium. The muscles, yes, the throat muscles will assist in swallowing by constricting and lifting the palatine muscle. So that is swallowing. So uh, up to here, it is all one voluntary. And then once you swallow the food and it enters here, uh, it becomes involuntary. So the food will pass through the oropharynx and then enter the laryngopharynx to the esophagus. So this is where the epiglottis will come and close the trachea, thereby guiding the food down the esophagus. The uh, scientific term for swallowing is called deglutition. So there are many phases in deglutition. The buccal phase or buccal phase is when food is still in your mouth. So you, what your tongue will do is it will uh, throw it against the heart palate and uh, it's uh, the oral cavity has packaged into a bolus. So now the tongue is going to push it from the oral cavity to the back of your throat. That is, but, you're, but it's still in the mouth. It's, it's uh, the buccal phase. So what happens is the soft palate will come down and make sure the food doesn't go into your nasopharynx here. And the epiglottis will very slowly close them so that the food doesn't go down the trachea and it will guide the food, food down the esophagus. So once the bolus is compressed and thrown against the hard palate and it moves to the back of the throat and pushed to the back of the throat, it enters the pharynx and then it's called the pharyngeal phase. So buccal phase is voluntary. Pharyngeal phase is when the soft palate is closing and the epiglottis is closing. It's in the pharynx. Then it enters the esophagus and by peristaltic movements. So peristalsis is a wave-like uh, contraction and relaxation of the smooth muscles of the esophagus, thereby pushing the food forward down the esophagus. So there will be sphincters. So the GI tract is guarded by sphincters so that there's not, no backflow of the bolus. And then when once it reaches the esophageal, uh, the sphincter before the stomach, it will enter the stomach. So there are these different phases of uh, deglutination. Some of them are voluntary and after that it's involuntary. Peristaltic movements are very uh, important for digestion because this is what is keeping the food moving forward. So here we can see the bolus that is packaged into one bite-sized piece and this is what you swallow. So what will happen is the, the muscles of the GI tract, there are two layers of muscle, the circular muscle and longitudinal muscle. So these muscle will pinch behind the bolus and the muscle in front is going to relax. So this pinching will progress down the tube. So as this pinching happen, it propels the food down in a wave-like motion. It is called peristaltic movements of uh, the GI tract. So here's a nice uh, gif of how food moves down the esophagus. So bolus is partially digested food. Peristaltic is a muscular contraction that will move the food forward. Uh, segmentation is the cycles of contraction that will churn the food and fragment the food and mix the contents of the food with all the enzyme. So that is called segmentation. So in general, so this picture is a generic picture. In general, the GI tract has four layers. So the inside hollow tube is called as the lumen of the GI tract. The first inner lining layer is called mucosa because it is full of goblet cells that make mucus. 
Mucosa will always, in turn, will have three layers. You know, mucosa will have an epithelial layer that sits on lamina propria and a sliver of muscle also. Yeah, mucosa muscle layer will be there. Then it's submucosa. Then here comes the muscular layer. You know, we saw the circular and longitudinal muscles here. It might have one more layer too in uh, different organs. And then the outermost layer is the visceral peritoneum or the serosa. These are the four layers of the GI tract. And you can see it has its own, uh, it is kept in place by the mesentery. And then it is highly enriched with arteries because as food is digested, the nutrients has, en has to enter the uh, blood supply. So you can see it's richly, very vascular. So these are the four layers of the digestive tract. Submucosa is made up of dense, irregular connective tissue. Let's look at the esophagus. Here's the histology of the esophagus. So it's a tube, it's about 25 centimeters long. It will also have the four layers that I told about. It has mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, but the serosa is highly modified. Here, the connective tissue is not serous. It is uh, called adventitia. So here you can see the lumen is collapsed. So it will open only when the food comes through. It is about two centimeters in diameter. So this is the bridge between the oral cavity and the abdominal cavity. It enters through the diaphragm through the uh, uh, hiatus here. And it has all the four layers that we talked about. And it is kept in place by adventitia. So here, this is the uh, hiatus or the hole in the diaphragm through which the esophagus will enter the stomach. There will be a sphincter here, esophageal sphincter and pyro pyloric sphincter. So only when there is a backflow here, we would call it heartburn when your stomach acid comes in your mouth. So there's lots of things happening here. So if you look at the structure of the stomach, um, so it's J-shaped. It's an alphabet J-shaped. This curve is called as the lesser curvature. The outside part is the greater curvature. And here we see three slivers of muscles. Circular muscle, longitudinal muscle, and uh, oblique muscle also. Because see here the picture, the animation in the bottom, the stomach is not just sitting there in the abdominal cavity. It is churning all the time. It is moving. Look how it's moving. So it is very, very muscular. And then you can see the internal uh, lining of the stomach is thrown into folds called rugae. So that's why the stomach can like increase in size, many, many fold. You know, when we overeat, the stomach kind of stretches, right? A lot. So there are so many functions that's happening in the stomach. It is first storing the ingested food mechanical digestion of food, and then it will secrete a, a range of chemicals and enzymes to break down the food. One important thing is it will produce an intrinsic factor, which is a glycoprotein, which will help in the absorption of vitamin B12 in the small intestine. So intrinsic factors are vital for absorption of vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 in turn is very important for uh, RBC production. So the expanded part of the stomach is called cardia. The top part is called fundus, the body, and the region closer to the py pyloric sphincter is called pylorus. So these are the regions of the stomach. Rugae of the stomach is to increase surface area. And there are two sphincters. So now let's look at the different cells, right? We always knew that the uh, stomach is very, very acidic because all the bacteria that come in through the food has to be killed here. You know, the stomach pH is 1.5 to 2. So whatever you eat is further cooked in this hydrochloric acid. So we'll study all the different specialized cells that are found here. So it has to protect itself from hydrochloric acid. So it will have a very, very thick layer of mucus here. 
So here, the histology of the stomach, you can see there's something called gastric pits. These are all gastric pits that will branch off into many gastric glands. And then we are seeing the four layers that we talked about. It will have uh, the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis. Here's, there is the extra layer of the uh, oblique muscle also, because it does a lot of churning action here for mechanical digestion. And then the serosa. And then you can see in the gastric pit, if you should uh, zoom into the gastric pit, this is where you'll see all the special cells that will make uh, the gastric enzymes and uh, acid. So if you zoom into the gastric pit, we see it's branching off to gastric glands and the special cell called parietal cell will make the hydrochloric acid. G cells will make gastrin. Chief cells will make um, a pepsinogen that will, that's inactive, then it will be activated by the hydrochloric acid to pepsin. It will play a huge role in protein digestion. So all these special cells, parietal cells will make hydrochloric acid. Chief cells is making pepsin. It is uh, studded with uh, G cells, uh, G cells, or will make something called gastrin that will stimulate the parietal cells and the chief cells. When there is no food in your stomach, there is no need to make all of them. So the D cells will make somatostatin, which will inhibit the gastrin. Not much absorption happens in the stomach. It's very, very limited. A very small amount of fat, soluble substances and water, alcohol is absorbed in your stomach. Aspirin can be absorbed and certain drugs can be absorbed in the stomach. But the main thing that's happening in the stomach is food is going to stay here for a long time, three to four hours, depending on the type of food that you eat. So it is playing a huge role in mechanical digestion, chemical digestion and sterilizing the food that you eat thereby protecting the body. See, that's why it's okay to eat sushi because your stomach is going to cook it. There are three main phases in digestion, the cephalic phase, gastric phase, and intestinal phase. So these are the three phases that's happening in your stomach. So the cephalic phase is before the food enters your stomach. So what happens is you're either thinking about food or you saw food or you smelled food. So what happens is the vagus nerve is stimulating the stomach to produce all its gastric juices. So that is called a gas a cephalic phase. So the next phase or gastric phase will happen after you have eaten. So once you eat the food, right? the stomach uh, swells up, it becomes larger. So it will activate the stretch receptors that is found in the walls of the stomach. It will activate the osmoreceptors. It will activate the chemoreceptors. So this is when 60% of the total secretion will happen. This is controlled both by the central nervous system and enteric nervous system. It will produce a local hormone called histamine. That in turn will trigger gastrin. And then there's also a neural, it's very strong neural response. It's called mixing waves. So what happens is once the food is in the stomach, it, the stom stomach will start to churn and move. So that is the gastric phase. So this is when a lot of digestion happens and it's mixing with the acid and it's breaking down. So this is three to four hours. And then once it slowly starts to empty into the duodenum of the small intestine, it is called the intestinal phase. This is largely controlled by hormones. Gastrin will stimulate it. It is inhibited by secretrin, gastric inhibitory polypeptide and chloecytokinin. So the accessory organs. So you, we studied the pancreas earlier as an endocrine organ. So let's look at, look at it as an exocrine organ here. So here you can see the pancreas, the head of the pancreas. It's very lobular. And then the body and the tail of the pancreas. There is this duct that runs through the pancreas. You can see all the lobules. 
and we studied how uh, it is populated by so-called islands of Langerhan that will make insulin and glucagon playing a huge role in uh, blood sugar uh, homeostasis. But you, it is also an exocrine gland making a lot of digestive enzymes that will decant through the pancreatic duct into the duodenum. So this is the first part of your small intestine. So it makes a lot of digestive enzymes and it, it, it decants it into the duodenum. Also some bicarbonate because uh, the liquid that leaves the stomach is called uh, chine. It's very, very acidic. So this region will neutralize it. It is posterior to the stomach. It extends from the duodenum up to the spleen. It is a retroperitoneal and it is covered by a connective tissue membrane. Islands of Langerhans is the uh, endocrine cell that plays a role in glucose homeostasis. Uh, in the histology, there are these special cells called ACNR cells that will make the pancreatic juice. And then we make up to one liter of pancreatic juice every day. So we have pancreatic alpha amylase that will break down starch, pancreatic lipase that will break down lipids, pancreatic nucleases that will break down RNA and DNA, and uh, proteolytic enzymes, there's two kinds. Proteases will break down proteins and peptidases will break down uh, peptides, polypeptides. And then the, as I told you, the pancreatic duct is going to decant all these hormones in the duodenum area. The other very important accessory organ is your gallbladder. So it's huge. It's the largest organ in your body, 1.5 kilos. It lies in the right hypochondriac and epigastric region. It has a right lobe and a left lobe. It is kept in position by its uh, ligaments, a round ligament, palciform ligament, and a coronary ligament. It is attached to the diaphragm and the back of your abdominal cavity. It has a huge range of functions. The it plays a huge role in homeostasis, in uh, nutrients and immune defense of your body, nutrient absorption in, uh, in our body. It is uh, protected by a tough fibrous capsule. So you can see a right lobe and the left lobe is divided by the falciform ligament. And uh, in the uh, posterior view here, you can see the gallbladder here. So you can see the hepatic portal vein, hepatic artery, and the common bile duct, common bile duct. So left and right bile duct will come together to form the common bile duct and then it will go into the gallbladder. So it, this uh, liver will make the bile. It's an emulsifier that plays a huge role in digestion of fats. And then it is concentrated and stored in the gallbladder. Histology of the liver is very, very interesting. The cells that make the liver are called hepatocytes. They are arranged in like a, a, a wheel-like pattern. And these are all hepatocytes. And you can see all the, the portals, the arteries and veins. It has a huge function, right? It has many function. It makes many of the proteins of your blood. Uh, it, it is an immune organ. It cleans the blood. There are cuffer cells called like macrophages that will scan through and uh, cleanse the blood. But what we are interested now is the, the bile duct. So these hepatic cells will make bile and these ducts will collect the bile. Here's a close up, so you can see the bile duct. So all the little canaliculi or small bile ducts will run together to form the bile duct. And then there are two uh, lobes of the liver, right? We have the left and the right lobe. So they will come together to form the common hepatic duct. And then it becomes the common bile duct it is stored in the gallbladder here, the gallbladder, and then it uh, decants into the duodenal area. Cuffer cells are macrophages. So the main goal of the hepatocytes is to make um, bile. So the bile is going to pass through all this little canaliculi and then it will form come into the duct.
So here's a close-up of the gallbladder. So we have the right and the left, the common. And then, so what happens is the liver is going to say, secrete bile constantly. It makes about a liter a day. That's a lot. You know, we never think about stuff like that. It is concentrated in the gallbladder and stored in the gallbladder. And sometimes people get stones here. And then we've heard so many stories of how, um, uh, you know, laparoscopically they will remove the gallbladder. So the number, step three is uh, the release of uh, CCK by the duodenum will trigger the dil dilation of the hepatopancreatic duct. And then it will eject the bile into the duodenum area. So all the fat that is in your diet will be broken down to triglycerides and glycerol. So it's an emulsifier. So now it is very easy for lipase to further break it down and it will be absorbed uh, by the small intestine. So it's a hollow pear-shaped organ, the gallbladder. It is found on the posterior surface of the liver. It stores and concentrates the bile. And as required, chlorocytokinin, CCK, uh, will stimulate its release. So if there is a lot of fat in the diet, duodenum receptors will pick up that there's a lot of fat in your diet. And then CCK will trigger the release of bile into the duodenum. The food then moves into your small intestine. Oh, this is long. It's a very, very long uh, tube, muscular tube, hollow muscular tube. The part that is shown in blue is called duodenum. So this is where we are going to get the bile and pancreatic juice and the, ch the chine. So the partially digested food from the stomach is going to enter the duodenum. So this is called as the mixing bowl of the body. Everything mixes here. It's, it's a short segment. Then comes the very long jejunum. That leads to the ileum. And then there is a, a sphincter here. Then it travels into the large intestine. So the duodenum is only 25 centimeter long. It receives chine. So chime is the partially digested uh, food from your stomach. You know, like, you know, times when we had vomited, you know, it's very acidic and very bad in our mouth. It's the chime. So now that's subjected to all the pancreatic juices from the pancreas, uh, buffers from the pancreas to neutralize the acidity. So now it has, it has, it has to become alkaline because absorption of nutrients is, uh, happens only in an alkaline environment. The next region is the long region, 2.5 meters. Just imagine, huge. It's all coiled up and wrapped up. And it's uh, the next segment of your GI tract. So this is where most of the nutrient absorption will happen. The third segment is the ileum, 3.5 meters long, huge. It ends up with the ileocecal uh, sphincter. Let's look at the histology. This is so interesting. So when you look at the lumen, you can see the circular folds called plique. So this is to increase the surface area of the stomach. And then we also see that the epithelium is thrown into folds called villi. And in the villi, there is microvilli. So all of this is to increase the surface area of the stomach so that when the digested food flows over it, it can absorb all the nutrients and then it will enter the blood supply here. So if you zoom into one villi, uh, so the intestine has the four layers we talked about earlier, the mucosa, that in turn has three layers. Then submucosa, muscularis, and the visceral peritoneum. So in the villi, you can see there are further finger-like projections called microvilli. And here you can see arteries, veins, and the lacteals that we studied when we studied the immune system or the lymphatic system. So the lacteals will play a huge role in the absorption of fat. Circular folds called plique villi and microvilli. The duodenal glands called Brunner's glands will produce mucus and buffers so that it can neutralize. 
Studded all along here is the payus patches. They are mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. They will get rid of a lot of the foreign uh, bacteria that might still be in the food. It has the four membranes, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa. So the muscularis externa has smooth muscle cells dominated. Uh, uh, so we have the circular layer and the longitudinal layer. These are very important for the peristaltic movements. All along the GI tract, we also have pace setter cells that will uh, set the rhythm of peristalsis. You know, we saw pace setter cells in the heart that will set the rhythm of the heartbeat, right? So here, the pace setter cells will set the rhythm of peristalsis. The green lacteal here that we see in the villi will play a huge role in absorption of fats. Now the food is ready to move into the large intestine. It enters the large intestine through the ileocecal valve here, which is sphincter, circular muscle. And this is like a pouch like part it's called as the C cup and then we have the colon and then out through the rectum it is much larger than the small intestine that's why it's called the large intestine and the large intestine frames the small intestine so the small intestine will be here and we can see how it's richly supplied with uh, arteries and you can see it has this bumpy segmented appearance it's called hostra so what happens is uh, this is where water absorption and compaction happens. Very little absorption of nutrients. Only 10% of the nutrients are absorbed here. So this hostra will make sure the, the fecal matter is compacted and then it travels a little slowly here through this hostra so that we can absorb more water. And it's, it has a very rich microflora. So that's uh, the probiotics that people advertise. It helps in the absorption of vitamins. And you can see the appendix here, uh, four to five centimeter long, out, coming off of the cecum. Some people have uh, it removed, you know, when, they, when it gets infected. Uh, but it does have, um, it is populated with immune cells and some bacteria, good bacteria. So that's uh, the projected function of the appendix, but you can live without it. So, the large intestine is extending from the ileum to the anus. It is 1.5 liters, lo 5 meters long, 7.5 centimeter wide. Main function is reabsorption of water and compaction. So the bacteria that live in it plays a huge role in absorption of vitamins. The colon that goes up is called ascending colon. Left to right is the transverse colon and descending colon. The, this shape is sigmoid shape. So this part is called as the sigmoid colon before it becomes the rectum. Hostra are the saccules that you find. Oh, there's a very interesting muscle that runs on top of the hostra. It's called uh, tinea coli. So this will uh, help with muscular contractions to propel the food, uh, the fecus down so that you can have a good uh, defecation. Histology, so this is the last slide, the histology of your large intestine. It doesn't have uh, villi and microvilli because this is not about absorption at all. Very little absorption of nutrients happen here. It is all about reabsorption of water and compaction of the fecal matter for excretion. It does have a lot of deeply seated mucosa, goblet cells, they produce thick mucus so that the fecal matter can move over it smoothly. It does have mucosa with deeply seated uh, glands that produce mucus, submucosa, circular and longitudinal muscles in the uh, muscularis layer and serosa. It finally ends in the rectum. So the rectum will have two sphincters. You can see the external anal sphincter and the internal anal sphincter. Internal anal sphincter is made up of smooth muscles and it is involuntary. External anal sphincter, it is voluntary. It is made up of skeletal muscle. 
So uh, you can decide when you are ready because of the pressure of the fecal matter, you have a bowel movement. So this is the conclusion of the digestive system. Please uh, ask me uh, questions.